And let me repeat this. So this is a this is part of a class of political social economic development in Brazil. Uh, the set in this session, we're going to be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the Brazilian and the world economy. Here we have a, a list of readings suggested uh, for the, to the students as part of the preparation for today's discussion. Yeah, next, Julia, please. Yeah, and some background information here. And uh, uh, we've seen uh, that the markers, markets have stumbled over the past month and the value uh, is about a third of what they were 30 days ago. We're starting to see bailouts and financial assistance on magnitudes that, uh, that uh, haven't been uh, done before. $2 trillion in the US, almost a $3 trillion in Europe, in the US dollars. Uh, just, uh, I thought that was interesting to add those two numbers here in order to give us an, uh, an idea of magnitude. So we're talking about uh, almost uh, 15 times the, what was spent with, uh, with Marshall Plan uh, in, in today's uh, money. And uh, we're talking about uh, an order of magnitude bigger than, uh, than we, we saw uh, in the last large crisis. So the big question that uh, everybody has in mind from economic and financial uh, perspectives is to what extent uh, this is a crisis that is similar to the one that we saw during the big depression in 2019. Uh, this is something that we're gonna be discussing today as part of uh, the context in which Brazil it will be dealing. Uh, when we think about uh, the, the vehicles of transmission of the crisis, uh, we're definitely going to be seeing impact on trade and commodity prices, especially because Brazil is heavily dependent on China as a trade partner right? and uh, in foreign direct investment. Right? The magnitude of, uh, of uh, the impact of the actions that the government has announced uh, uh, it's close to $200 billion as well, which is unprecedented also in Brazilian history. Uh, at this point, uh, it is very hard to infer what's going to happen. I think it, it is fair to say that uh, uh, it's going to be a tough year. Perhaps we're going to go through another recession after a, a decade that was where we saw the worst economic reforms in Brazilian history. So. It's, uh, we are, we are uh, bracing for very challenging times. And uh, one of the goals for us to discuss here, to what extent some of those challenges also gonna be creating opportunities. And if there's room for optimism in spite of uh, all the, uh, the big problems that we're gonna be facing very soon. Next, please. And here are our stars today. And uh, John Welch, uh, executive director, Brazil, Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce, uh, former managing uh, and chief managing director and chief economist at uh, HSBC. Uh, many generations of uh, CIPA students alumni know him as uh, as a faculty member of the faculty. Uh, John has also spoken spoken uh, in our classroom a, a number of times, so we are very happy to have John back in our virtual classroom. Another star directly from Rio de Janeiro, talking throughout the field is Thomas Trebat, director in the Columbia Global Center, and uh, one of the most and uh, foremost experts in Wall Street uh, on Brazilian issues, and uh, in, in a so, not so distant past, uh, uh, managing director in Citibank, and chief economist for Latin America. And last but not least, uh, a, uh, Camille participation, uh, Professor Gray Newman, who is going to be joining us, and I apologize for Gray for the miscommunication, and I really uh, thank him for joining us on, uh, on short notice. Gray will be uh, giving us a historical perspective how he sees this crisis in comparison to uh, previous ones. Uh, apart from teaching at SIPA, uh, in the past, Gray was one of the key analysts uh, and shaking markets with his um, comments on the Brazilian economy as a former 
uh, managing director, Maria Stelli. So uh, the way that we're going to be discussing this is uh, threefold. John is going to be giving a general overview of, uh, of the global economy. Uh, then Tom uh, will be addressing uh, more specifically what's going on in Brazil and uh, in which ways the Brazilian government is trying to, to tackle the problem. And, and Gray, as I said, uh, will be making some, uh, some comments and will be addressing uh, COVID-19 more from a historical perspective. Before I, uh, I turn over to our speakers, and I wish you could move with the slides, please. I have two announcements to make. The first one uh, on the left-hand side is that there's an event here at Eulas, also a virtual event that, that uh, the Global Center is co-sponsoring, where we will be discussing the impact of uh, COVID-19 in Latin America tomorrow. So feel free to sign up online. And uh, something that I just found out and I thought was good to share, there's a movie uh, that's going to be released at Netflix uh, on the 17th this week. It is about the life of a Sergio uh, Vieira de Mello. Maybe the, for the younger generation, uh, that's uh, not a familiar name, but for those of us who are interested in diplomacy and international affairs, uh, Sergio Vieira de Mello was probably the most important diplomat, diplomat that Brazil has produced in the last uh, half of a century and who died tragically in an attack in Iraq. And uh, his movie, this movie, based on his story, is going to be available on Netflix. I strongly recommend that uh, you check it, uh, since you, all, you guys all have a, a lot of time to spend on binging in a different series. This one is worth trying. All right, so without further ado, let me hand over to John Welch. And John, thanks again for joining us tonight. Uh, good afternoon or good evening. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, Sydney, and what a great panel you have here. Uh, a lot of old friends. Um, uh, I'm going to try to share my screen uh, right now. Um, and let me uh, just try to make this into a presentation as opposed to uh, not letting me do it. Yeah, I'm blocked by the thing at the top. So I'll, I'll just leave it like this if you can see it okay. Um, uh, well, I have, I, I prepared a, no, a number of things on Brazil. I'll give the, the general backdrop and uh, I'll add to the conversation later when, uh, when we go to question and answers. But uh, this, is, this is a pretty tough one, I have to say. I don't think any of us have ever seen anything quite like this. And uh, we have quite a bit of experience on this panel between Gray and um, and Tom Trevat and Sydney as well. Um, let me just go to where we were uh, last November, I guess maybe we only perceived uh, about these things um, early this year, uh, but uh, it was a little late actually, it started in November or even maybe perhaps even earlier as they say. And certainly we had a, a very interesting thing with world interest rates and this brought about a lot of theories, some that I would say uh, are not quite as credible as others about why we have real lower interest rates. But over the last 20 years or 20, more than 20 years, I go back uh, and this was one of the things that always allowed me most of the time to see the cup half full for Latin America, especially. And that is that the trend for interest rates was down, but the reason for the trend for interest rates going down uh, and the reason for the trend is demographics, but you can see that rates are going down and certainly this crisis with the collapse in investment demand that we're having, uh, we're gonna get again, very you know zero world interest rates for quite some time. Uh, but really the trend was there and, and you know my view on central banks and I was at one for a little while, I was at the Fed, is that central banks uh, can mess stuff up pretty well, but in terms of forcing things and forcing things downward. These interest rates are, are low because of demographic reasons, not necessarily for monetary policy reasons. And if you're a central bank, you don't want to fight against that trend. You want to accommodate that, that decline or, or recognize the decline. So 
uh, certainly most of the central banks in the world over the last 30 years have become Wixellian in the way they go about monetary policy. That means that Wixell, Knut Wixell was maybe the inventor of uh, central banking along with uh, Bejo. And he said, well, what you need to do is to try to find the neutral rate of interest, the real rate of interest, uh, translate that into a nominal counterpart with your thought, your target on inflation, and certainly was the father of inflation targeting, and then flatten the curve through credibility. And don't fight where the real interest rate's supposed to go. And I think uh, we've had, that's by, you know, starts and stops. I think a little bit too much um, emphasis have been put on central banks and not enough on demographics because it explains all the stuff we got wrong uh, since the late 1980s. I worked with a very bright young economist. He, of course, he's not young anymore, just like the rest of us, but a guy named Kent Hill, and he was working with Ralph Bryant on explaining the U.S. current account deficit um, through demographics in the late 80s, and he was thought of as a heretic. He was quite attacked within the Federal Reserve System. Uh, and it turns out he was just spot on. Carlos Salinas de Gortari was going, moving into a very aggressive privatization uh, effort at the end of the 1980s because he was worried that we're going to have a massive scarcity of capital. And Kent said, no, it's, we're going to have a glut. And all the conditions for that glut are still here. Um, uh, at least for now, there was a number of things mitigating against that, but we'll see. Uh, so, you know, demographics really explains it. Why? Because uh, it explains savings and investment patterns across countries. And with the aging of the world population, especially in the G7, that means that the demand for investment went, is going down. And, and as uh, the boomers, I'm uh, the tail end of the baby boom, uh, moved into middle life, you were saving more, right? And so you had this huge I increase and the emerging markets should be in that high savings area. The Asian ones are, at least for now, China is aging at a record pace because of their population control, but we're getting very fast aging in Latin America as well. Uh, Brazil right now is aging as fast as China without having all these sort of gov government imposed policies and certainly China tried to reverse theirs years ago. The one place that should be importing capital is Africa uh, because they're younger. And unfortunately, the reforms, you have to have a combination of two things. You have to have the demographics and you have to have the financial and economic structure to be able to credibly absorb this capital. We've seen a number of balance of payments crises over the years where countries were importing too much capital given their infrastructure where they were in, in reforms and couldn't do it. And the tragic exception in all this is Africa, and I'll show you in a moment. Certainly, to my mind, and this was the conclusion of these policies as well, is that, you know, current account balances were not the big risk. I mean, there's a beautiful uh, model by um, uh, Maury Obsfeld, who was a professor when I was uh, at Columbia when I was an undergrad, and Ken Rogoff. It's a wonderful model, but it works really well with emerging markets, but it doesn't work very well for the United States. And it's been predicting a balance of payments crisis in the United States for about 30 years now, as well as another well-known economist, Paul Krugman. And that's not what we had. It's, it, these dangers come from leverage, and certainly in emerging markets, current account deficits, which mean a lot of high capital inflows, can be leveraged too much and create a big problem. Uh, but certainly the US had a serious leverage problem in 2008, 2009, and not really a current account deficit problem. And, and the markets worked quite well. Um, and I'll just go over the sort of basics of this model and then talk a little bit more uh, about this and, and conclude. Um, uh, Kent was criticized, well, you're assuming perfect capital markets and life cycle, I use life cycle, other people now use, there's just a million uh, updates to, to what they were doing. Uh, not using a life cycle, but using permanent income, et cetera, and, and overlapping generations, different cohorts. But, he basically wrote another paper with a world model that ended up translating later into the McKibben Sachs model that said, well, that even makes my point even stronger because if, if countries are, if we don't have perfect capital markets and uh, countries can absorb the capital that they otherwise would be in a perfect, then the glut will be even worse. And he was right. And here we are still with this. So uh, with this aging and looking over to the future, you know, young but aging, you know, savings are low but increasing. Investment is high, so typically savings is higher in investment. Local interest rates, if there's no international capital flows, are, are high. Uh, and um, 
and you have a current account deficit because that's the definition of, a, uh, of an excess of investment over savings. If you're middle-aged but aging, uh, you have much higher savings because of most of your population is in, and the, I'm using dependency ratios, I'll show some of those in a moment, uh, are, in, are, save, are earning more than they're spending, and they're still high investment because the companies are still investing in, in increasing productivity of the workforce. So that's where you get this inversion of the savings investment equation. And uh, interest rates are high but declining. And, and you started to get synchronization worldwide uh, for, for the last 40 years. If you're old and aging, your savings are lower and declining because you're retired, you're not working anymore. Now that's been changed because a lot of people work much later now than they used to. And, and certainly life expenditure is, is much less. Uh, is much longer and investment starts to slow down and then you don't really know where you are because you're getting a decline of savings and investment at the same time but in all likelihood uh, you're going to get you're going to have low and falling uh, real interest rates and of course if you you have need for structural reforms you won't be able uh, to bring in the capital you probably don't have uh, very high savings rates like Brazil for example uh, and you don't know where the current accounts going to be typically you'll get booms uh, of capital inflows and so forth but most likely you have also real interest rates high this is this context completely changed of course uh, since the COVID-19 breakout but just to show you uh, current uh, percentage of young in each of the populations you see that most of the world has uh, has aged, the number of young in the population has dropped rather significantly. And that's also uh, true in Latin America, but you can see really the only place that has still a high proportion of the young is Sub-Saharan Africa. And again, I talked to tragedy, it's really quite tragic uh, that the countries in that region have not been able to, to, to do the reforms necessary to take advantage of really an amazingly low interest rate environment. And the aging is also, uh, stark, uh, especially in the G7, uh, and that means investment is, is lower. And, and the, 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 the drop in investment with, with you know, still higher savings rates is, uh, is what really explains how, uh, how uh, the, the rates have come down. But that's going to change because, as I said, there's not very many young people worldwide, and we have uh, uh, a, low, a longer uh, life expectancy. We don't really know where this is going to go, but we do know as the world ages that real interest rates continue to drop. And barring, you know, maybe a post-COVID-19 baby boom in the world, I think that trend is going to continue. And certainly the current circumstances have engendered a collapse of investment. And that means uh, rates are going to drop again in real terms. Um, certainly how this plays out, demographics may change. The, the pandemic itself may actually change some of uh, the, the cohorts. Uh, the elderly are more susceptible. And certainly if you look at the, certainly in New York State, that they publish every day the updates now, uh, the, the, the age demographic of, of fatalities is heavily skewed towards the elderly. So we may, at the other side of this, I don't think the projections that we're seeing in terms of how this is gonna play out and so forth really don't show we're going to have a big change in demographics because of it. But that is if we if the the original forecast that some people came out with, um, especially Dr. Ferguson, we might have had something, but he's now corrected those a little bit. Um, certainly uh, the geometric progression of this of the, this virus is impossible because once everybody's infected, you know, have no no more infections. And, and that's the sort of herd uh, the herd. Um, um, a, con a concept with uh, uh, immunity. Um, but the major policy and growth risks, you know, don't come from current account balances, but however, uh, what comes next? We're going putting into place massive fiscal expansion, massive monetary expansion. Uh, that really uh, is temp should be temporary. I think most of the countries that we're gonna talk about, I would include Brazil in this, have fiscal situations that a reversal, a quick reversal of these expansions uh, can take place rather quickly, but the big risk here is uh, if they don't. And so we have a lot of distortionary policies being put into place, a lot of intervention by governments. And if we, if, as we get back to normal, I'm not gonna predict when that's gonna happen. Uh, many of these should be sort of 
uh, disassemble sort of the way the uh, London uh, Olympics were with all their temporary uh, spots for sports. So let me just talk a little bit about COVID-19. It's somewhat, uh, no one would accuse me of being obsessive compulsive, would we? Anyway, I've been, you know, had to make sure that I understood all the math and things like that. I'm not going to show, I'm not going to bore you with a big long presentation. I'll leave that um, uh, for another time or, you know, I'm good at boring people. So that's pretty good. Um, anyway, uh, where we are, this is as of today, as of yesterday. Okay. These, there's a really good website. It doesn't allow you to download the data, but it allows some transformation. It's worldometers. Uh, and you can see as of this morning, uh, we had active cases of a million four, um, resolved cases of over 620 million, uh, 620,000. Uh, and it shows you, uh, the, the cases that are active are mostly mild, 4% are, uh, are serious to severe. Uh, and th the thing is at some point, the left-hand side is a shift to the right, but it doesn't seem to be happening. The, 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 of the, uh, closed cases, we've been holding at 21% uh, uh, mortality rates. Uh, now those are closed cases, so that doesn't have anything to do with the overall mortality rate, but it's been holding at this ratio for about a week and a half now. It used to be uh, a little bit more skewed toward recovery, but I expect over time that to go back towards recovery. Um, you can also transform the, the, the cumulative uh, or the logistic graphs into logarithms, which is a much better way to go. Doesn't seem like we've, it looked like we had a false uh, top of the thing. And then that makes sense because this is spreading to, to countries that uh, don't, don't have that many infections. So uh, it's still, it's something I look at five times a day. Um, this is the more important graph. This is the United States. This is the logistic graph in logarithms. And you can see it looks like we're starting to flatten out. Um, and that's, and this type of thing is, we've seen a number of different um, models showing that we're starting to get to the inflection point. And this one clearly shows we're at the inflection point. We've gone, we're on the other side of the curve, but we're at a very high level uh, of, of getting new cases every day. So we're still at about 25,000. I haven't checked, haven't been able to update that today, but still this mean, and the fact that it's flattening rather quickly means that some of the, the social distancing uh, policies that have been taking place are working. Um, here's Brazil as of this morning or as overnight. Um, looks like they're at the beginning of this for sure. Uh, if we go to the logistic, it's the, the slope is declining. I don't know if we have passed the inflection point because, and I'll let uh, Tom and the others comment on this because we, uh, um, Brazil is in the late uh, uh, parts of, of summer and the early parts of fall and flu season, et cetera. That seems to go along with the, the, the trajectory of this virus. Um, it hasn't started yet. So we'll see if there's nothing coming back up in July. Doesn't look like this is flattened out yet. It's, it just doesn't, there's no way to predict what this is gonna do, but uh, certainly uh, it looks like we're still on the ascendant part of this curve but I won't speculate on that. I will steal from JP Morgan, and I'm sorry about this. It's got all messed up in translation. So yes, I stole these today, and that's why I had to pull the all-nighter to try to get this thing done. But you can see these are projections uh, from the Ministry of Health and WHO that show that Brazil is right around here uh, and still in the ascendant part of this and looking at a peak somewhere around uh, May the 1st. Uh, and you can see uh, the trajectory of other countries leveling off. It, it is below certainly the sort of standard China curve uh, and well below. It, it started off faster than the United States, but below it now uh, and uh, certainly below Italy. So, so far uh, it's sort of going to schedule, but also Brazil is, is hotter and apparently that may have some effects on transmission uh, that so that, that might, it, if it's hot out, the R naught might be a little bit lower the amount of people, one person who has it infects. But I think it's way too early to figure on this. And here is um, another measure, uh, containment. And certainly, at, especially in the United States, but also in Brazil, private citizens have done their own containment and private companies have done their own 
uh, containment um, uh, than than necess than you know the governments have been pretty fast, but they've been, been behind sort of uh, the private sector for sure. And you can see here, Brazil is sort of uh, on the higher level of containment, which might come to a, as a surprise to many. But it looks like the you know the lockdowns, especially at the local, the, the municipal and state level, look to have already been implemented quite quickly after the first uh, coronavirus uh, 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 case was um, was diagnosed. And then uh, also we have this other measure of social distancing, Brazil hasn't done quite as well uh, as, uh, uh, as some other countries and it sort of ha it has kind of stopped. Uh, and I'm not gonna make any political statements, I'll let the others talk about that. But on the Brazilian side, uh, things look um, that they're going to sort of course, but uh, for sure, I did not bring in the, uh, the World Economic Outlook, which came out yesterday uh, but certainly, and everybody's guessing, and they admittedly guess that when you look at, they're looking at a world recession, a drop in GDP of 3.6%, uh, but it could certainly be larger, it could certainly be lower, but, uh, it, you know, the question is how quickly does the economy start going again? And uh, this, is, uh, this is the real question at this point, and none of us really know. So I'm going to stop my comments there, I've gone my 15 minutes, and come back with other pointed comments when we get to to the question and answer. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. And uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions and clarifications. And uh, if one of the students would, who are enrolled in this course would like to, uh, to make any questions. So while you prepare questions, uh, John, could you clarify on the, on the projections that uh, you mentioned about the world, that the World Economic Forum is expecting the the, uh, the the economy to uh, to go down by three to point five four percent this year uh, overall. Can you think in terms of uh, what are the regions that are going to be most affected or impacted? Sure, uh, that's an extremely hard one as well, Sidney. I, I you know we looked. Uh, I, my my best guide right now is is the IMF World Bank reports. I not. Uh, uh, usually don't trust them so much, especially with the Latin America. Uh, but uh, all of them are indicating that the most of Latin America is going to be affected, the, the, one of the most, and certainly Africa is going to get hit very, very hard. And that's more a question of infrastructure, of medical infrastructure, uh, uh, and uh, the ability to social distance. So there's there's a number of Asian countries, number of uh, African countries and Latin America, where you, it's hard in the big cities to social, socially distance. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly in, in China, especially in some of the, the more dense populous popular areas, it's very difficult to say. But, um, you know, the question is, what kind of policies are going to be efficacious? Uh, well, certainly the fiscal expansion worldwide will help people keep their jobs for a while. Uh, then it really, the real question is, is it's more up to the timing of, uh, of the virus. Now, uh, there's many professions that could, that were able to go remote very quickly. Uh, my job, I was able to go very remote, very quickly. The universities have gone remote very quickly. Many of the information services, but there's some that you can't. And the question is, is when you even, you know, companies that continue to, to work that are distribution companies like, uh, Amazon, et cetera, are having some problems because uh, uh, they still have to social distance and they have to create a work environment where you're not in contact with other people. And that's quite difficult. In some of the manufacturing parts, not, it's not as hard because you have a lot of uh, ro ro uh, ro robots used and also usually on assembly lines, you do have some spacing, but that's not so true in electronics. So it, it, and then the farmers, they're not really inhibited from working. So agri-industry agri should work out all right, but we had this massive collapse in international trade and, um, and uh, the prices of commodities. So that's where it becomes very sticky for the agricultural sector. They've already been hit by a number of things uh, in a number of countries. Brazil's was helped, uh, soybean exports to, to China were helped by the trade war between the United States and China, 
but that was only in volume. The, 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 the consequent decline in the price of soybeans kind of wiped out whatever gain, they're kind of neutral, it wasn't a big gain for them. And market share in commodities is easy to lose. It doesn't take much to lose that. But let me finish one other thing. I think your question depends upon the policy response, and it's not for just the fiscal and monetary side. It is the trade side as well. And I think we've seen most, mostly um, not a great reaction on that front. We've seen some selective reduction in tariff duties and tariffs on imports of medical equipment primarily uh, worldwide, but we have not seen an opening. And it seems to me that that is the best response, especially when you're talking about importing inhalers and all this is all phasal, right? So some parts of the United States are being hit at other at different times. Same thing between Brazil, Chile, Peru, uh, Mexico, they're getting hit at a different pace than, uh, than, than the, the G7. And therefore, and the, you know, ventilators are reusable. So if you don't allow for free trade in, these, in the, this equipment, I think it's very deleterious. I think uh, many have thought, oh, this is, and it seems that in Washington, they seem to think that they're vindicated in some way or, uh, by, by their protection of stance and all this. I would argue otherwise. I think it's urgent especially for inputs to production for medical care and, and, and pharmaceuticals, it's urgent to, to, to open the markets and also provide intellectual property protection, which is all in, it, all in the sort of middle of the negotiating table. But right now uh, we have seen, you know, protection of policies in, the, in a number of countries that we never even seen, but they're typical in Latin America, like uh, taxing exports or doing things like that. But, uh, I think uh, really, uh, especially for the other side of this, uh, resisting protectionism even more so than before is, is crucial. So. Thanks so much, John. So next, we're going to focus more uh, on Brazil. And so let's hand over the presentation to, to Thomas Trebat, directly from Rio de Janeiro. So Julia, if we could upload the presentation. So, flow's yours. Thank you. I don't see the presentation yet, but I know it's coming. Thank you very, very much, Sydney. Uh, Julia, a, a pleasure to be here uh, with John and Gray and with all of you um, uh, as we look at how this crisis uh, is playing out in Brazil. And John has set the table very well for us to stand the broader international context. And I'm sure he will delve into some of the details of Brazil too when we get to the Q and A, but let me focus mainly then on Brazil. Go straight to the point. Uh, my first point being that uh, obviously there's never a, a good time for a pandemic to arrive, but this one has caught Brazil at a particularly unfavorable historical juncture, both economically with an, an economy in recession for basically for the last five years, uh, and socially with alarm bells sounding in every social indicator that matters, from health and sanitation to unemployment, to extreme poverty. Uh, all of that was worsening before uh, January and February, for years before January and February. And the data on the spread of infection, as John has expertly uh, led, uh, shown us, uh, are alarming. Uh, the data today, sadly enough, uh, recorded another, yet another record in a number of deaths and, in, in a, and rapid increases in, in the number of, of new cases. Mostly it has been up till now concentrated in the two largest urban areas of Rio and Sao Paulo, but now spreading out in the interior of Sao Paulo and elsewhere in the country. And this is of great concern to us in Brazil, as it is, I'm sure, to those of you listening to us in New York and other hard hit areas. But here in Brazil, you do not have a lot of margin for safety in terms of the health system. The health system, as I want to tell you, is a good system. We'll talk more about that in the rest of my remarks but it could be easily overwhelmed uh, by numbers if numbers like this, if John's suggestion that the worst is yet to come and won't be here until the end of the month, early May, this could be easily overwhelmed. Not enough beds, not enough uh, ventilators, uh, not enough PPEs and all these jargon, all these terms that we've all become sadly familiar with. There's not enough in Brazil. So our only hope is containment, as John pointed out to us. And yet that remains a very difficult policy in any country and perhaps particularly so here in Brazil where there is, and to say things clearly, a failure of leadership at the presidential uh, level. 
noted, that failure noted all over the world. And that's a glaring weakness at a time when you really your only hope, your best policy, lacking equipment and having a vulnerable population in a very large country is containment and isolation and social distancing. Those, those techniques work. They're showing signs of at least working, uh, working reasonably well here in Brazil. And it would be disastrous if the president's uh, insistence on weakening and going back to work prematurely uh, uh, causes another outbreak in the, in the disease. And as we speak, maybe before we hang up on this call tonight, the Brazil's much lauded uh, uh, Minister of uh, Health, he's quite the equivalent of Dr. Fauci, but more political uh, in the United States, Luis Enrique Mandetta, named none of us knew probably uh, until a few months ago, who's become really the symbol and the, of resistance in Brazil and resilience and isolation. He could be out along with this whole team as we speak. It's a complicated story, maybe we'll get onto it later, but it's concerning when containment is your only real, real hope. But is this calamitous backdrop, uh, five years of recession, fiscal problems for maybe 10 years, is also highlighting for me the strength and re resilience of institutions in Brazil. So that's kind of one of a bottom line I wanna leave with you, put it out there for debate. We're kind of stripping the veil from the Brazilian economy and from, and from Brazilian society in a sense and seeing really what is making this place move and how strong are those wheels and, and pulleys and levers uh, that drive the economy and society on a day-to-day -day basis. We're seeing them now more clearly. But anyway, uh, let's maybe move through, Julia, if we could, the first couple of that slide there tells you what I'd like to do in the balance of my remarks. Uh, just hold that for a second. Look at the economy on the eve of the crisis. Look at what uh, Brazil's economic response has been. And then maybe peek beyond the crisis, uh, the outlook for the Brazilian uh, economy. The next slide is, uh, repeats the uh, comments that John has made. So I'll skip right over to, uh, to the economic dilemma on the next slide. <clears throat> uh, you'll see there uh, in this slide that, that the five years basically, excuse me, very, five years of very slow growth in Brazil, what we call a lost half decade, uh, where growth has been considerably below trend. Uh, uh, growth in the Brazilian economy, despite hopes of the country, was quite meager in 2019, just about 1.1%. In fact, for the entire decade since 2010, growth on average in per capita income has not been much higher than about 1%. So that means you're doubling your income every 70 years, and that's obviously insufficient in a, in a middle-income country like Brazil. Investment as well has been quite, uh, quite low. So expectations for 2020 were already low when the, the virus hit us, and now growth is collapsing in the second quarter, as it is all over the world. This is a sudden stop that none of us, John, were prepared for in graduate school to take into account. We learned about other types of sudden stops, and not sudden stops in production and in commerce and in business and in every other aspect that matters to the modern economy. The forecast for this year, as John tells us, are still evolving. Say, Paul, has a, was the first out there, ECLAC, the first uh, out there with a forecast of about minus 4.5% for the Brazilian economy this year. Doesn't sound too bad, but it's really a, a major recession, one of the largest that certainly I ever have witnessed. The World Bank says minus five, the IMF minus 5.3, private forecasters have gone as high as minus six. I suspect, um, I suspect uh, it'll be even worse than that before the where all is counted, but matters is maybe not so much that GDP number, but the, but the strength of the recovery. We'll get to that later. But suffice it to say, we're, we're really, you know, the trough hopefully will be now in the second quarter, this period of time through June, and the true numbers when we hear them will be, will be horrifying. Poverty has also been increasing. That's the next slide, uh, Julia, if you would switch to that one. Um, didn't quite, uh, I went for the visuals here instead of the most up-to-date data, but I think this still shows us uh, a slide from the Vargas Foundation uh, the backsliding that has occurred in Brazil, the increases since uh, 2014 approximately in poverty and, uh, and extreme uh, poverty, they've been rising. Millions and millions of more people uh, are by Brazil's definition of poverty falling below poverty and a good percentage of those in what Brazil calls extreme poverty. Those numbers after years of significant declines, that's the blue dotted line that goes down, declines in the poor population had begun to inch up and the data only covered 2017. But if you, if you look at the latest data through 2019, that, that adverse trend of increasing poverty and extreme poverty has only increased. 
Uh, social programs, fortunately, in Brazil are strong. I want to make this point. They've suffered in recent years because of fiscal constraints and, frankly, a lack of priority on social programs. Uh, the, net, the, private, the pension system in Brazil, uh, people who are receiving pensions of one sort or another from the government, that amounts to 14% of GDP. That's about twice as much as we spend in the United States on pensioners. So that provides a sort of unintentionally a sort of, of, uh, of, of, of income stabilizer in this day and age. Uh, uh, so the social security system, the SUS, Sistema Unico de Saúde, uh, is a health system in Brazil, which is really a model for the rest of the world. It reaches into all corners of Brazil. There's not a family in Brazil that isn't within reach of a, a health worker. So we've got a good reach of the health system. It's not a strong system. Uh, but it's a broad system and people do have help. There's the iconic program Bolsa Familia, uh, which uh, today reaches 14 million families. It's a symbol too of a certain neglect in Brazil, social programs. There's something like a million families, a uh, million and a half families on the waiting list to join the program, Bolsa Familia. There are other programs too for the disabled and for the rural poor and, and so forth. Uh, but those kinds of programs have, are in place, they're working, but they're weakened by years and years of, uh, of a lack of investment. Lack of investment characterizes Brazil in general, but it has affected these social programs in particular, just when we know how important social programs are to the future of any economy and especially the future of the Brazilian economy. It's now we need these social programs more than ever, and we need to extend them and not to curtail them. And that's not a political statement on my point. I think that's going to be a, a clear conclusion in the, in the policy debate that will follow. And it's just already occurring here in Brazil. Brazil's fiscal space to start out, and that's the next chart, a little bit, a little bit jargonistic and partially in Portuguese. <clears throat> John referred a little indirectly to this. Uh, Brazil doesn't have, uh, by ordinary economic, economic measures, uh, a lot of fiscal space to spend, like the U.S. can spend up to 25% of GDP. The numbers are going to be far more modest. Brazil is not in as good a position in terms of debt to GDP. That's the dark blue bars, red against the left-hand axis. Uh, by the time Brazil came out of the 2008-2009 crisis, its debt to GDP ratio was only about only about 50 or 50 between 50 and 55 percent. And now, as you see, it's almost 75 percent of GDP and it's going to have to go up. This is a major change in the conversation in Brazil. They're going to spend whatever it takes uh, to save the economy, to save lives, to reactivate the economy. So we're looking at debt to GDP ratio to go above 90%. Uh, is this, uh, this has to be done. I think it's a fait accompli, uh, but it does mean that serious fiscal reckoning is going to have to occur at some point in the future, or that the country is going to have to significantly reorganize its fiscal finances uh, we'll talk more about that later as well. Additionally, Brazil is dealing with a large number of shocks. John mentioned them for us. So I don't need to go into them. Uh, the trade shocks resulting from the, the U.S.-China war, decline in commodity prices, John mentioned. This next chart, if you look at it, Julia, they switch to the next one, just shows you what John was referring to. Uh, the dark red line, this is something I borrowed from the World Bank's report that came out earlier this week, <clears throat> shows the capital outflows in all the large emerging markets of the world. And that dark red line, compared to previous global crises, this crisis stands alone in the terms of the flight of capital from all the emerging markets. And Brazil is a case in point. It's one of the largest uh, sources or hosts of foreign, uh, uh, foreign capital. And you can see what direction foreign capital has been taking for a while and now in an accelerated fashion with the, with the crisis upon us. Okay, so enough of sort of the background and why this hit us at a bad time. The next slide I'd like to look at is Brazil's response. Um, and after a slow start, I mean, people, this took the Brazilian government with a sort of what is known as a somewhat pejoratively here in Brazil as a neoliberal orientation, a preference for the market versus the state in, uh, in economic activity took this government and caught it very flat-footed. Uh, so it's take a, it took a little while for Brazil to change gears, but they are changing gears. And that's a message I want to transmit to you tonight. Uh, uh, they've thrown aside the fiscal goals for this year and probably for next year as well, uh, loosened up on many regulations, moved lots of money around, and are starting to respond. They've come up with a war, a war budget to separate COVID expenses out of the regular budget, 
That is something that was uh, re re approved virtually unanimously by the Brazilian Congress, which by the way, is a very proactive player here in Brazil in urging uh, greater expenditures. The priority in the war budget is for the health system, as I've said, but there are also policies, I'll talk about them briefly in the time that I have, uh, there are also policies to provide income support, uh, especially maybe reaching the most vulnerable, including informal sector workers who aren't registered in any government registry uh, of deserving recipients, but they need to be registered very quickly. There's liquidity support. Didn't talk about that very much, but these are huge amounts of money uh, uh, being released and made available both directly to finance and to business to keep operating so that when we do recover, and uh, God willing, that won't be too much in the future. There'll be firms <laughs> that can reopen. They won't have all gone to bankruptcy. And then there's a fiscal response in Brazil, uh, in measures to shore up the economy. Let me look uh, in the balance of my right remarks at some of these uh, policies on you know, the main income support policies, not all of which are yet approved. And only this week does some of the money start to flow. I've mentioned Social Security already as being a very important social safety net. Uh, that the social security expenditures have been increased slightly, not much, maybe they'll increase more, but that is uh, uh, one uh, aspect of government's actions. Uh, uh, there's a 13 salary, for example, being provided for social security recipients. Um, and the Bolsa Familia program, the iconic program I referred to earlier, has received some extra funding. The major policy that's new and different is something called uh, Auxilio Emergencial, emergency assistance for all workers who qualify. This is sort of what the economists call helicopter money, just money that drops into your account because your government thinks you deserve it and need it. it. Brazil has an enormous advantage here in that it has good statistics on who the poor are. Uh, that includes Bolsa Familia recipients who work in the informal sector, so they're kind of, the government knows them and other conditional cash transfer programs also have fairly up-to-date records of the poor. Brazil has kind of led the world in these kinds of programs and they know who the poor are, as I said, where they live, where, what their bank account is, and they can reach most of them uh, pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, the uh, program uh, is, involves a fairly modest uh, pay, cash payment, 600 reais a month for, free, for three months. That's about $125, so not much, but it's the difference between life or death, maybe, for the most vulnerable people. Women, house of, house of whole, uh, heads of households will get something like $250 a month. The new feature of this program is to add in informal workers who aren't in anybody's lists and who would run risk of, excuse me, of falling between the cracks. Uh, they don't really work and are not formally registered to work and not formally recorded. Uh, as being employed. Uh, so this could be a very large number of Brazilians who are presumably right now without any support whatsoever, unless they've got some savings to fall back up on, which presumably they don't. Uh, this could be a large number of those who fell between the cracks, so to speak. There's many 18 million people in Brazil uh, applied for this uh, auxilio emergencial just on the first day that the enrollments were open. So uh, it's, uh, and it's going to take some weeks, I think, before a significant help arrives to these, to these people. But ultimately, <clears throat> um, just looking at Bolsa Familia and this special emergency aid programs, you have the potential at least to put some money in bank accounts for up to 55 million Brazilians, one quarter of the population of Brazil. So that's important. There is money set aside for three months in the government budget, but it doesn't, I don't have the slightest doubt that they'll find money for more months should that, that be needed. So that's uh, an important example of income and employment support problems. There's another that I wanted to mention, um, if you get some comments on it, and that is working with the government, working with the private sector to prevent dismissals, prevent firings from occurring. There is legislation being discussed, not yet approved, that the workers would accept 70% reductions in their salaries and their workloads for the next three months only, as long as companies don't fire them. Uh, they would accept that reduction and they'd be compensated partially by increases in unemployment insurance. And the companies themselves would be able to benefit from certain government liquidity programs uh, if, uh, if they adhere to the stricture not to fire their workers. It's being contested in the courts. It's going to take a few days or maybe weeks for that uh, program to roll out. But it's, it looks to me like an important program and it's an innovative type of program 
which could uh, 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 have an important effect. Briefly about liquidity policies, not to get to too much into the weeds on what the central bank can do, but this, the central bank is another example of a very strong uh, and quasi-independent institution here in Brazil with a long-standing rep reputation uh, as a very good and well-managed central bank in terms of inflation uh, targeting in particular, also exchange rate management and other issues, and also overseeing the banking sector. The central bank, in line with what other central banks have done, the Fed, the, uh, 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 the Bank of Japan, uh, uh, the European Central Bank, and so forth, have done similar measures, but this is quite it's quite, I think, unusual for a developing country uh, bank to be able to do something along those lines. So Brazil has announced 35% of GDP. I won't quickly add up those numbers, but it's a, uh, it's a lot of billions of dollars uh, in liquidity lines. Not money given away, mind you, to banks, but money to provide resources to banks to be able to lend and to renegotiate loans. And also is a way to get funds directly to Brazilian companies to pay their salaries and to pay their suppliers. Again, the risk here in Brazil, as it is in the USA, but especially here in Brazil, is you, once companies cease to exist, there's no hope of recovery uh, in that company and in, and in many of those sectors. So those central bank actions are very important and they're innovative and um, the government has moved more quickly than I thought. One of the most innovative policies, in fact, which is subject to a lot of discussion in Brazil, I don't want to get bogged down on this point, but it would allow the central bank not only to buy bonds issued by the government to finance the government's effort right now in, 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 re, in recovery and reconstruction, but also to fund, uh, to underwrite the bonds, the liabilities, that is to say, of private sector companies. Never been done before in Brazil. It requires a constitutional amendment. It's close to approval. I think it could be very important to save at least the, the 400 largest companies in Brazil, which have more than 100,000 workers, or more than 10,000 workers, excuse me, those companies will be greatly aided if the central bank can help them out by buying their bonds when there are no private, there's no private capital market functioning. Finally, on the fiscal side, and, um, and before I reach my conclusions, uh, Brazil's total fiscal effort is about three, so far, announced so far, is about three to maybe as much as 5% of GDP on the fiscal side, what the government is doing in addition to what it planned to do. That small, the US, uh, trillion, the, the US uh, $2 trillion package several weeks ago, that's 10% of US GDP. But three to 5% is a, is a reasonably good fiscal effort in the context uh, of Latin America. The biggest debate about that fiscal effort right now in Brazil are emergency packages for states and municipalities who are on the front lines here in Brazil, just as they are in the United States. We also have a federal system and health is in the hands of states and municipalities here in Brazil. Uh, so their, their uh, revenues have evaporated, their demands for spending have exploded. Um, uh, their, their revenues uh, have been, and their balance sheets have been decimated. The bat this is a political battle in Brazil for reasons maybe too complex to get into. It's a standoff between some of the governors who are potential presidential candidates who want the funds and a president, Bolsonaro, uh, who controls the purse and doesn't want to see his his potential political uh, opponents uh, too greatly come, emerge as heroes in all of this. It's almost like President Trump and Governor Cuomo a little bit, but more so here in Brazil. But Congress, it seems to me, and this is another example I wanted to point out to you, Congress seems to me to be lined up behind the governors. So this package is likely to go through, hopefully within the next couple uh, of days. Um, just a quick word, it could seem like a detail, but it's not, <clears throat> if the, if, if Brazil is going to expand its, its expenditures, its fiscal expenditures very significantly, and there's no one to buy those bonds, the private capital markets are frozen and all that money is leaving Brazil, who buys them? And I think who buys the government's debt and finances the government? And I think the answer is the, is the central bank. Not directly, but by, not directly by giving money this to the central government, but by buying, um, buying bonds of the central government. And I think it can do it so safely, and I think it can do so credibly. It won't create fears all over the world that Brazil has somewhat gone off in a crazy populist direction and faces a highly inflationary future. I think it will be done for as long as it needs to be done, but, but no longer. But it will be done in the measure that is required. A big advantage that Brazil has is that interest rates here in Brazil are truly at record lows, just as uh, some of the uh, old-timers here on the line have never seen uh, 
uh, GDP numbers like we're seeing now. We've also never seen interest rates this low. 3.75% is the basic overnight rate now uh, versus 40, 50% in years in un years gone by. So that means very simply that the cost of the government issuing debt and servicing the debt is really quite modest. And that debt can eventually be resold into the marketplace once the crisis uh, passes. So that tells you a little bit about three dimensions. There are many, many others and many details about what Brazil has tried to do and how Brazil is responding. Um, and I think the points are the government has been innovative and has moved quicker than mine might have expected as it caught the government's, this particular government somewhat by surprise. But that also the government had social institutions pre-established before this government came to power that are actually working well. So that combination of the two, I think, uh, underpins Brazil's response. But let me conclude by, <clears throat> and maybe kick off the discussion, if I go to the final slide, on uh, reassessing the growth outlook in Brazil. Julia, if you could maybe move to that one, not that it's terribly instructive. But I separated this out into a short term, a medium term, and a long term. In the short run, the sudden stop drags on is the way I wrote it. There can be no wavering on the quarantine or self-isolation, no premature rush to reopen the economy. I'm very worried about the dismissal, the pending dismissal of the health minister. Let's see who takes his place. But I think even if uh, President Bolsonaro continues to insist that the, con the economy go back to work, I don't think that there's gonna be a great deal of take up in Sao Paulo and in Rio and other, other major urban areas most affected by this because the, I think popular opinion here in Brazil, much informed by the press, another strong Brazilian social institution, knows the dangers of premature opening. And when in, in Brazil, we can't afford a second and a third wave, John referred to that too, because we're already, our resources are already, our health resources are, resources are already been exhausted by the first wave. Um, so a second or third wave could be ruinous. The recovery in Brazil will be gradual and U-shaped, not V-shaped. Um, it's going to take months. Uh, I think we'll be opening up parts of the economy over the next uh, 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 three to six months, but not all of the economy. Growth, the growth numbers, as I told you, for 2020 will remain low in my view in 2021 and 2022. And yes, full recovery or anything, anything that one could reasonably call for recovery is not till 2022. Those growth numbers are gonna be very modest uh, in 2021 and 22. The only numbers I have now are like from the World Bank or from Brazilian, Brazilian forecasters and they suggest growth of about 2% in 2021 and 2022. Hopefully that's too pessimistic, but I think that's what we'd be prepared for. The stagnation uh, of the Brazilian economy, the semi-recession continues with the risk that we're looking at another lost decade, not just another lost half decade. But there's no reason to think for despair. Um, uh, John also mentioned this in his comments, there are certain sectors of the Brazilian economy that are doing rel relatively well. Logistics is one, uh, everybody, the food supply in particular, working quite well, uh, a good nationwide system uh, of roadways and uh, transportation, telecoms, we're all talking to you tonight on internets, and the internet working, it's working well all over the country, businesses migrated to the extent possible, including our own business at Columbia University here in Brazil, migrated to the internet, that might not have been possible some years ago, but it's working well. Agribusiness is doing quite well, uh, and will be a strength of the economy. The financial sector, I don't think can be battered for an indefinite period of time, but it enters this period in a relatively strong state. Uh, state. So I think that's another strength, uh, uh, a pillar, you might say, of an eventual recovery. Um, and then, of course, uh, what will happen after, what, what, I what other industries survive the crisis and which go under, I won't hazard a guess, other than my personal bias, which is to say the smarter industries here in Brazil, of which there are a number, uh, who are already better integrated in the global economy will be among the survivors. And some of the older dinosaurs from the past, the inefficient uh, manufacturers from the past who've had quite a hold on economic policy in, for decades here in Brazil, they may not survive, but I've gotten a little bit beyond my brief in that. Well, what about the beyond the horizon uh, scenarios to finish up? The, the government's agenda uh, must change. This, the Bolsonaro, Paulo Gages, the Brazil's uh, finance, uh, finance minister, economy minister, must change practically in its entirety. Their mantra has been fiscal adjustment, they had some successes, 
but it, further fiscal adjustment, I think, is dangerous. Uh, a premature rush to get back to reducing the debt to GDP ratio, increasing the primary uh, fiscal surplus, that could be disastrous if the economy slips back into recovery. Ma microeconomic reforms, another mantra of the Bolsonaro government under Paulo Guedes, will always have some place in any Brazilian uh, economic agenda as they are keys to productivity. But much bigger questions are, uh, are pushing these questions of microeconomic reforms and more efficiency, uh, making a uh, uh, better environment for business. They're important, don't get me wrong. But the bigger questions are pushing those into the background. And I think the first and the biggest question is the provision of what the economists call public goods to the society, health and, and education and sanitation and public transportation and, and so forth. The provision of those public goods is critical to uh, a society's prosperity and survival in times of pandemic. They need and deserve and must receive much greater attention, focus and investment in the future. And the social inequalities, I'm a little less clear on this point, but the social inequalities which this crisis has laid bare uh, I suspect they're going to work their way back into agenda and not just be seen addressing social inequalities, not just something the left does uh, uh, in Brazil, but something that it, it makes sense, not even just moral sense, which it does, but economic sense for the entire country. So I think addressing those inequalities, getting that curve, getting that line of poverty and extreme poverty to continue once again to go trend downward, to expand those social programs, it's got to be part of any agenda. I think it'll be part of this government's agenda uh, and uh, through the end of its term in 2022 and, and any government that takes its place in 2022. And in this respect, uh, the history of the Brazilian economy is very instructive. If you go back decades or a century or more, let crisis come, Brazil somehow adapts, lessons are learned, and those lessons are put into practice. Uh, I would say one lesson is that Brazil's economic and social institutions, apart from government policy, and with a special emphasis on social programs, programs have been far stronger than anyone might have expected. Uh, and they provide uh, a basis for a new and stronger Brazilian economy once adjustment is accomplished and the economy resumes a better and higher rate of growth. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tom. No, it's a we couldn't have a more comprehensive uh, perspective on what's going on in Brazil from someone who's based in the country and knows thoroughly uh, about the Brazilian economy and Brazilian society. So uh, for the students, I uh, would like to open up for questions if you have. And I'm starting to get some questions in private here that we're gonna be saving for the Q&A. Otherwise, let me hand over to Gray Newman, Professor Newman, who is a keen analyst, um, observer of the global uh, economic situation, and uh, he's gonna give us a, a historical perspective of uh, to what extent this time is different, and to what extent, uh, to what extent mm, uh, the different medicine uh, should be applied. So, Gray, all yours. Sure, thank you very much, Sydney. Um, I was trying actually to think, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. I was. I was trying to think of ways to disagree with Tom and with John, but I agree with most of what they said. So I apologize. Uh, I apologize in advance for not being able to uh, disagree more. Um, the I, I guess the only thing that I would, um, rather than going through the global financial crisis, which is what some people are comparing this to, um, the global financial crisis, if you recall, was a complete different animal. It was, it, or, it originated in the financial sector. And because of the impact of stimulus in China on commodity prices and on the Brazilian economy, the, um, the impact on Brazilian production and particularly Brazilian consumption, discretionary spending in particular, was extremely limited and very short lived. Um, and as you've heard before, this is not a this has not begun as a financial crisis, um, and uh, it has started in the in the in the real economy from um, the collapse of production and consumption of particularly dis discretionary consumption uh, due to the to the virus. I my my one concern would be uh, you know starting points matter, and um, the starting point in Brazil, as Tom has highlighted and John has mentioned. Um, uh, 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 the strong reputation of the central bank. Um, 
However, I am concerned that as, as both um, my previous speakers that alluded to or raised, uh, Brazil's had a very difficult and disappointing growth trajectory in the last five or six years, even longer. And the, the debt stock in Brazil compared to where it was 10 years ago or even three or four years ago is at levels that um, are sort of approaching sort of alarming levels. And so, you know, my only concern here is that what Brazil needs to do in terms of the near-term policy mix, I think Tom has been very eloquent in laying out the near-term policy mix and the, the, the benefits from a lot of these strategies. Uh, but my concern is how much fiscal space, how much space will markets provide for Brazil actually to be able to implement and execute on this. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work on uh, debt intolerance. And um, I, I, I do begin to be concerned that market participants are going to, could begin to say, uh, you know, can Brazil really tolerate these levels of, of debt um, uh, without creating a, a substantial unraveling? So I, if I, you know, maybe what I would say is, is you know, I'm a little more, I'm a little more concerned. Um, this is not the fault of the Brazilians. Uh, clearly, however, the starting point and the strength of where Brazil's fiscal accounts in particular stand today um, is the responsibility of policymakers. And I think it leaves Brazil uh, in a more difficult position, perhaps, uh, and significant risk. I also might push back a little bit with the notion of, uh, you know, QE in Brazil. Uh, the, U the U.S. and if you even look at the paper that I believe Sydney assigned to the students to read from Barry Eschen Green, arguing that you know fiscal and not monetary policy can't do a lot, but um, that doesn't mean that they should not be engaged. And after all, remember, you know G7, particularly the U.S., is able to borrow at rates significantly below potential GDP growth. Um, you know, my concern is that that advice that applies in the G7 sphere sphere. Um, has limited applicability in emerging market space and maybe limited applicability in, in Brazil. So let me just leave with a, just a, a sort of a cautionary note and turn it back over to you, Sydney. Thanks very much, Greg. Thanks for the insightful comments. So uh, before we kick off the conversation here, like, let, me, let me ask a question for the three of you. To what extent we can uh, make a parallel between uh, the approach that the Brazilian government has undertaken vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. government's approach, and what are the limitations of both actions? And uh, uh, if you were on uh, on the shoes of an advisor to both administrations, what would you suggest? And uh, I, I see that Gray is is looking forward to answer this question. But uh, why don't we start with uh, whoever wants to? to address this very, very briefly. Yeah, John? I can start. Um, if you want, if you allow me to share my screen, <laughs> I've made a lot of uh, uh, slides before this, but um, to, to Tom's point, these are the uh, initiatives that the central bank put in place uh, or is putting in place. It looks like they've already put them in place because they're all done by, just, by fiat, by the government, by the, some of it needs some approval, but some of it does not. And you can see the central, at least at the central bank, you have a lot of similar policies to what's going on in the United States, with, with the exception of, you know, giving, you know, buying um, municipal bonds, because um, there are none of those anymore, neither their state bonds, but they did, uh, they have a huge package that in Congress, as Tom said, uh, to give some relief to the states uh, on their debt and the suspension of debt payments. But you can see that they are now taking in private paper as collateral. Uh, so you, you see the, uh, the liquidity augmentation policies, loans backed by debentures, loan backed by these, these, these number, these long-term deposits that have specific collateral, specific guarantees, doing repos in Brazilian sovereign bonds. That's never happened before, and that's in dollars. Um, uh, loans backed by, uh, by bank notes, uh, relaxed regulation on agricultural notes. So you're seeing the central bank giving at least liquidity to uh, 
uh, things that it never used to do. And now they've also reduced, and, and the main thing that they did, and this where I, I think I, I, I'm on a different, I'm, I'm much, much more orthodox than Tom, I'll have to say, sorry about that, Tom, but um, I'm not quite so negative on, on what they're doing. But what we're seeing, the real question is, will Brazil go back to this market segmentation and, and financial repression that we saw uh, in starting in about 2009 uh, and lasting until things were undone in starting in 2016. And it used to be the, the sort of order of the day uh, having a segmented market, but we're starting to see a relaxation of these massively high uh, reserve requirements. There is no country in the world that has reserve requirements anywhere near where Brazil has. And this is a legacy of the inflationary times. You basically have inflation uh, and, um, and to be able to capture enough uh, inflation tax to finance the fiscal side, you had to keep high reserve requirements. And there's really absolutely no need for Brazil to have this. For example, I, I'm gonna give you two more graphs here. Just bear with me. First, this is a graph of nominal credit uh, against uh, inflation. And you can see there's a negative relationship. So uh, it, it's actually the inflation side that causes what happens with the lap, absolute level of credit, not the other way around. The low inflation rates have, has, has, have allowed Brazil to expand its credit, and we've seen uh, most of the financial repression go away that we had recently. Here's another thing. Reserve requirements are associated, higher reserve requirements are associated with higher inflation. Again, this is the causality runs the other way from many of the arguments is that uh, when the government had, was going into tight fiscal problems, people would reduce their money balances. And the only way to capture that inflation tax was to uh, commit more financial repression by raising reserve requirements. Um, and you know, just to give one last thing, you can see that uh, there was a big expansion of subsidized credit that was starting to be unwound. Uh, and it was being unwound mostly through market means. Um, how was that? You can see that this financial deepening stopped and was starting to recover before this crisis. Certainly, we're going to have some problems with that in the next year. But you can look at the three, the two policy rates. First, the Selic rate, which is controlled by the central bank, and the TJLP, which was the, and now it's the TLP that is now market-based. When you have these very highly subsidized rates on subsidized credit, the only way to tighten monetary policy was to shove the Selic rate twice as high as it otherwise would. So we, I don't see the, the, this government, nor future governments for that matter, going back on what, we, what was really Medellin's dream and then he was subverted, uh, uh, this sort of lack, this, this, these distortions, uh, I think, are not going to come back with this rather large expansion of public sector credit, even though it's going to happen through the public banks. It's going to, I think it will be similar to, and, and please, uh, the other, please comment on this, the first QE not things that the Fed did, the, the uh, supplement for money market funds uh, to intervene in markets that were broken. MBS was broken too, but then it got uh, fixed rather quickly. And you saw all of these markets, once their funding came back, they, all these assets went off the, the, the Fed balance sheet. I think, I think these policies are reversal to good end. And temporary, the temporary nature of this will, 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 I think, give anchor expectations, certainly on inflation. And finally, that's also true with Social Security reform. We finally have a, not a solvent Social Security system, but something that's not wildly insolvent and getting even more insolvent, at least has a, a minimum retirement age. And I think that gives individuals and investors a, 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 something to cling on to. So I was looking at the curves. You have a steeper curve, but we're still talking about a long end of the curve, very long end of the Brazilian curve at 7% in rise, and that's, that's fairly encouraging. I'll stop there. Yep. Tom? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Sydney. I think uh, we kind of switched roles. To, uh, John talked an issue about containment policies. Let me go back to containment policy because you've asked to contrast the U.S. and Brazil. And I would say that the situation in Brazil for those in the United States listening to us tonight is, is very similar. You have a president who's skeptical or took a while to be convinced of the need for containment and governors who've taken the lead. Um, so the reaction is very similar. You've had a big pickup by the local population in adherence. The, the health minister, the late great uh, health minister has 75% approval rating. That's one of the reasons he's not political, kind of in political hot water. 
uh, at the present. But uh, I'm taking advantage of your question. So the reaction has been similar, the containment has been similar, the strength of state and local governments has been similar. Uh, the, the disparity, I think, uh, Sydney, is, is sort of a global inequity that countries like Brazil, which in Brazil is far from the worst case, and we're a middle income country, but Brazil can't get, is, is always going to get outbid for face masks, for PPEs, for ventilators. There are stories in the newspapers, anecdotes in the newspapers of Brazilian shipments being hijacked and sent to Europe or di diverted to the United States. We have no capacity here, um, Sydney, to do testing uh, uh, on a large scale. It almost doesn't exist. It doesn't really part of the conversation yet. Maybe in a couple of months, we'll be able to do that. Brazilian labs will gear up. Manufacturers will provide that domestically. But we're flying blind here in Brazil and will be for weeks or months uh, to come. The U.S. is a little bit ahead of us there, and I don't see any way to, uh, to uh, uh, catch up with that. And then the final thing I would say is, um, although President Trump does a lot to isolate the U.S. diplomatically, Brazil is really isolated diplomatically right now. It doesn't get along that well with its neighbors. There's no real sort of a sense that if Brazil needed significant international help, which hopefully it won't, but it might, there's not a, like a network of allies and friends who can share equipment with Brazil, who will take an interest in Brazil, will help finance Brazil if need be. So I think all of those are some differences in Brazil. I just don't know what Brazil can do, Sydney, to, to, uh, to make up for those differences in the approach between the two countries. Thanks, Tom. And Gray, uh, your two sure, cents. The, sure. The only thing I would add is I think the Brazil as a as a recommendation to a policymaker would be to continue to focus on the things that you need to focus on, trying to provide liquidity markets that threaten to break down, trying to provide um, income support to reduce the level of, of potential unemployment increases, uh, try to provide protection for enterprises that are ha having a liquidity crisis convert into a solvency issue, but always keep you know one eye behind you, remembering that Brazil is not a reserve currency economy, and that the lessons and the ability of the U.S. and some of the G7 countries, what they're able to accomplish, um, Brazil may find itself in a much different different position. And so just to be aware that while the U.S. often in a crisis period enjoys a flight to quality and uh, that benefits the U.S., what we saw from the chart earlier from um, you know, the outflows in emerging markets in Brazil are something that that are likely to limit the the policy space. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much, Great. Uh, before we start the Q and A part, let's try something different here. And I prepared this polling, so a sentiment analysis. So everyone, uh, please, you should have received uh, three questions. Can you see them in your screen? Yes. So let's take a couple of uh, like one minute to go through them. I don't see them. Uh, does Thank anybody you. also have any problems with, uh, with the poll? It should be on the screen. Yeah, and Tom, uh, if you go to on the bottom of your, uh, uh, of your main screen, uh, there's polls or polling it's like some of the simulations i've seen on the spread of the virus over the last two weeks <laughs> <laughs> right before my eyes it's evolving where do you see the polling uh sydney because i i voted it was covering your face but i don't see the polling it should be uh this is a new tool for me too. Uh, I'm assuming that once I uploaded the poll, okay. it should be on, this, on your screen. If you move your mouse down to the bottom of the screen, it appears polling. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, Thanks, I couldn't vote. I didn't get the vote. It went straight to the screen where it was tallying the... Uh... I think it is because you are a co-host. Oh, okay. Okay. You know who counts, Thanks. Chad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the tiebreaker. No, thanks, Julia. All right, there are 15 more seconds. 
Is voting mandatory? <laughs> well, in Brazil, yes. <laughs> not, not in the US. <laughs> All right, so ending the poll here. And I'm going to relaunch it just in case uh, if uh, somebody needs to do it again. Okay. So Can we vote twice. <laughs> uh, that would be auditing. Okay. All right. So let's start with QA. And Julia has a question. Uh, Julia. And um, thank you. Um, actually, I wanted, um, I feel like I'm skipping the line here, but okay. <laughs> thank you, Sydney. Uh, I just wanted to know, there's a lot of economists talking about, uh, so we have to do some really expensive fiscal policies right now, social and economical. How likely do you think it is that uh, we'll be able to pass in Congress a tax reform that will include um, taxing the share of dividends or taxing big fortunes so we can increase um, tax revenue for the state? Good question. Yeah. I can give you months what the Treasury Secretary's answer to that question that we had earlier today. And maybe just give, he, you know, he basically said right now they're focusing only on this virus. And any fiscal things that they're taking are to alleviate and try to keep, uh, especially in uh, jobs in the small and medium sized corporations. So you've seen some tax relief. The, the other question is, okay, what happens when it's over? Clearly, as Tom said, you're going to have this big fiscal deficit surge and big debt surge. What happens later? Um, the response he gave was that they're going to go right now, all privatization is on hold, right? And, and any uh, tax reform is on hold as well. But they'll need even more so to come back uh, and have the revenues. He doesn't see, he thinks the tax reform part not necessarily including an increase in taxes and maybe whatever they do they'll as an increase they'll try to do temporarily uh but he sees they're going to definitely need uh um the revenues from privatization and the efficiency gains later once things sort of settle down but certainly now is not the, the time to be selling assets you don't sell at the bottom but uh, that was the, the answer he gave and it, it seemed like a good answer to me. good yes tom yeah, I think uh, Julia's question is a good one, and uh, um, I, I agree with what John uh, has just said, but I do think that Brazil is going to have to take a long, hard look at tax reform. Broadly speaking, uh, the tax system is very regressive here in Brazil, and that the poor pay a higher uh, percentage of their income in taxes than the very wealthy do. Dividends are not taxed. Um, uh, uh, there's no Piketty tax here where you're taxing uh, um, uh, and net worth uh, in any significant respect. I, I do think, John uh, and, and Gray, that taxes are going to have to, I'm not certain how much of a revenue gain this will be and what, what evasion will be like, but Brazil is pretty good at tracking people and, and has a pretty good uh, internal revenue system. I think there's going to be a tax reform that will make, to do three, three things that will make the, the tax system less complicated and, and a little bit more business friendly, so to speak, uh, which is very, it's very complex now. Second, it would shift the burden more to the upper income groups, maybe hopefully get to the top 1%. I don't know if they can or not, but I think they should, um, reducing the weight of, uh, of indirect uh, uh, taxes uh, in that respect. Well, I'll, I'll just leave it at there, but I, um, uh, I, I do think that, uh, I do think taxes, unfortunately, are going to have to rise uh, in, in terms of percentage of GDP. That's how you pay, that's how governments pay back their debt after, uh, after a war. And this has been, as the government is very clear in saying, this is a war. Yeah, so the debt of the war has to be repaid. And that means, that means higher taxes wherever you can grab the, the, the money. But it should be done, as John is suggesting, in a way that helps the recovery and not hindering it. Very good. Uh, I just wanted to add something, because I agree with um, both, of the both sets of uh, comments by Tom first on the social distancing and the reaction of the governors and what he just went through. Certainly Brazil's tax system is hugely full of distortions, regressive and incredibly complicated. But Brazil, its federalism has maybe not worked quite as well as the US and the free press as well in sort of containing uh, policy to uh, focusing on doing their best. But uh, it is problematic and the states went into this in horrible shape. Uh, fiscally uh, and really 
to do a full tax reform in Brazil, you would have to define the tax base of all the levels of governments. And maybe this is the way to do it. We took something like this to do it. I hope so, because as you absolutely put, point out, correctly point out that the tax system is, is, is unwieldy. It's uh, it, it, trying to get to these things where that you have much more neutral type taxes and, and uh, less cascading or triple, quadruple, quintuple uh, taxation of different parts of, of the product and make it more less regressive is, is, is very difficult. But maybe this is the sort of explosion that, that is needed to get it done. Good, thank you. So we have a few questions here on the chat and uh, let's start with uh, Marcio Tesman da Silva. And his question actually is something that uh, Tom made reference to. Uh, and he's, he wants to know a little bit about the, about the SUS and to what extent uh, it can help Brazil overcome this crisis and, uh, and uh, in which ways the robustness of the system uh, is really a, a good example as, a, as, a, as you mentioned, Tom. That's an excellent question by, uh... I mentioned it, it goes back to the previous question about the difference between the US. We do have a national health system here in Brazil. And I would say, thank God we do. Um, the the SU system is much maligned uh, here in Brazil. I mean, if you've got uh, uh, upper middle income, uh, upper income people would never use the public hospitals. Uh, they go to private clinics, which don't accept insurance and private doctors. But the SUS is available, Sydney, it seems, for everybody else. Uh, there are hospitals here in Rio, where I live, and certainly in Sao Paulo, which are what they call the reference hospitals for the treatment of COVID patients. And I think they could pretty much provide the basic care, maybe not handle the most complex operations and not in scale handle complex operations. But if, if you or any one of us was with COVID and needed hospitalization, you'd be in good hands, uh, and there are still beds available. So I think Number one is sort of like the final, um, the, the, the SUS system, the public hospital system is actually a good one. But what I emphasized and why I think it's so important is the role of, of health workers here in Brazil. As I mentioned to you, uh, the Brazil doesn't just wait for people to come in and say they've got a health problem. Many people don't know how to use the, the, the bureaucracy or don't approach doctors, don't have money for doctors, don't are not acquainted with the facilities available health workers here in Brazil, we've done many studies of this at Columbia over the years, health uh, are very important in going door to door, in knowing what's going on in your neighborhood, in your favela, uh, what, is, uh, what is actually going on. So I mean, it's uh, uh, hopefully right now, hopefully right now that's exactly what's happening in favelas like Rocinha, Cidade de Deus, Maré, Paraisópolis, and Sao Paulo. You, you're seeing, and I hope this is true, that the rate of infection in, the, in our poorest urban communities where people don't have good health conditions, don't have access to running water at all times, don't have sanitation, yet the rate of infection so far is kind of small. And I, I'm, I'm completely beyond my, my, my database here, my depth in, 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 in data, but I do believe that's a testimonial, as I was telling you earlier, about the effectiveness of the, of the, public, uh, of the public health system. It's really the backbone of healthcare uh, here in Brazil. And, and I think, as, as Marcia's question gives me an opportunity to say once again, it's, an, it's, it's a social institution that works well, uh, despite the fact that it's held in kind of contempt by the elite. Uh, uh, it, it, it's what probably gonna save us uh, in this crisis at the end of the day, could be that the SUS works so well. Yeah, no, pretty good, thanks Tom. And uh, there's a question from Andresta Azevedo, and I guess maybe Gray, uh, since uh, Gray, uh, address the historical issues and the previous crisis, because uh, her, her question is about um, bankruptcy of the country. And uh, when you think about the 80s, like when um, Latin American country declared a moratorium, and uh, even like the recent, more recently, right, Argentina has been uh, sort of uh, in some similar situation. So uh, do we see this kind of risk uh, under the present circumstances? Well, listen, I, um, I haven't seen uh, what credit default swaps have been doing in Brazil in the last uh, week or so. Maybe someone else could pop it up on the screen, but um, I, I, I clearly think the, uh, um, the risk is there, and, uh, and my concern is the risk is rising. And um, 
I concern the risk is rising because of the combination of a significant deterioration in the in the primary fiscal balance from what was already an alarming deficit to a much much larger deficit, and the the, the growth in the in the debt stock. So I mean, the good news, as we know, is most of the debt in Brazil is held by Brazilians. A lot of it is locally issued. Um, it is it, Brazil has tremendous levels of reserves um, relative to external debt. Uh, so, you know, there are all those um, uh, considerations, uh, but I do think the the risk, not, not a, you know, certainly not a base case scenario, but I think the risk is that um, growth is damaged longer because think about bankruptcy at a, at a corporate level, um, it damages the growth prospect. And a lot of these measures that, you know, John has emphasized as being temporary in nature, um, for political reasons with a deterioration growth uh, prospects, uh, the temporary ends up lasting a lot longer than you expect. Um, and I think in that case, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think the risks are, I think the risks have risen uh, t today in Brazil. Good. Uh, John, Tom, does anybody disagree? I was just going to mention that, yes, the temporary tends to last way longer than temporary, unfortunately. Uh, Columbia University knows this quite well, although all of you are probably too young. But when I was an undergrad there, they were still playing in the temporary Wood Stadium at Baker Field that was erected in 1926 when Sid Luckman played for the Columbia Lions. The last time they actually did something really good, I guess. Or well, recently they're pretty good. But, yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, I think they finally redid the stadiums in the – late 80s, early 90s, uh, I don't remember, but uh, 1926 to 1990 was about how long that was there. Good. Thanks, John. And a question from Gabriel Purisoli, and uh, he's addressing politics, right? It's, uh, so even though we're talking about the economic impact of COVID-19, but it's, uh, we cannot dissociate that from the, the political landscape. Uh, so as uh, as observers of the of, of the situation in Brazil, and uh, Tom, you mentioned that a uh, current minister of health uh, has been or is going to be ousted uh, very soon. Uh, can we assess uh, to what extent uh, the current administration has the ability to deal with this crisis, and in, or uh, if not, like, what are the possible alternatives? Um, well, uh, I, I think, I don't know, here, this is kind of a, a political question. What kind of game is President Bolsonaro playing? Because he certainly, he himself may have had, he went with a large group to New York, to uh, Florida recently, and 22 members of his team got sick, some of them presumably seriously. So he cannot be unaware of the, of the risks, even in his own personal life. Uh, so what kind of game is he playing? Um, in, in politically, and I, and I think it's a game that's, that says, I'm going to be known as the, the guy who wanted to reopen the economy <clears throat> as quickly as possible, and I want the governors and Congress and my political opposition to be known as the one who put up through unnecessary uh, hardships that lasted too long. But I don't actually see, so I think that's the game that's being played. President Trump plays this game, as you know, in the United States. Uh, they, they talk a big game, but they don't actually change policies on the ground. And the containment policies have a broad public uh, popular acceptance. And President Bolsonaro's pop popularity is down to about 30% and probably heading south. So, the, so what's behind that thinking on his part? He can't be unaware of the risks and uh, he knows public opinion is against him. He wants, he's looking to a day when when uh, uh, people are going to thank him for return, re finally talking sense into these scientists and medical people who wanted to put us through unnecessary suffering on the basis of unproven worst case scenarios. In the short run, uh, talking about the dismissal of uh, 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 Health Minister Luis Ahiki Mandetta, which hasn't occurred yet, I predicted it before and he's managed to survive. I think that whoever takes his place, I've seen a list of the preliminary names, is going to probably continue the same policy, Sydney, maybe a little bit more adroitly politically, not to upset directly President Bolsonaro, to kind of humor President Bolsonaro, 
but not substantially change, uh, if that's the nature of this question, change uh, Brazil's uh, uh, approach to containment. Because as I've emphasized in my remarks, we don't have any other strategy. We can't test. Uh, we don't have hospital facilities. Uh, we, we, don't, uh, we, we, uh, we don't, we couldn't possibly handle a second wave. So, so I think it's a part of a complex political game. It's the only way I understand President Bolsonaro's attitude. And I understand that by looking at what President Trump is doing, because I think he's doing pretty much the same thing. I don't know if that was clear or not, but I don't think, I don't look for any disastrous changes in the short run or changes, significant changes in the next couple of weeks or months in terms of, of isolation and containment. Good. No, thanks, Tom. And uh, a question from Cassia, and I think for, uh, for, the, for all of us here, right, it would be interesting to share some personal perspectives, uh, more than the, the political or uh, our political views. But uh, does it make sense to think about reopening the economy uh, immediately? Right? So, so there are some uh, controversial views about vertical interventions, but I think there's, what, what there's no question about is that the need for the country to back to normal uh, as, as fast as possible. Uh, and uh, we're starting to see even here in the US uh, on a state level and the discussion about uh, uh, trying to, uh, to get things to work uh, as usual. Uh, Governor, Governor Cuomo recently announced that uh, the worst is behind us, uh, probably. And uh, so I think it, this is an indication that uh, we might be starting to see there's some, some lifting on, on the quarantine uh, requirements. So uh, for, for the panelists here, could you please share with us uh, your personal perspectives on, on how you see this happening? If I understand, just two quick comments. I think the quickest way to reactivate the economy is containment and social distancing. I, I don't think, I think everything else is uh, uh, a dangerous and misleading fairy tale. Um, uh, because of the, the, the follow-on consequences of it. And, and second, I think one advantage we have in Brazil, and then also in the United States, but mainly here in Brazil, Brazil learns lessons very quickly, and it's seeing what already uh, countries like Austria and Denmark and now Italy, uh, Germany, uh, Spain, they're starting to reopen the economy, and they're showing the way, Sydney, uh, that Brazil will start to reopen its economy, starting in areas of the country which are less affected, where there are adequate uh, uh, testing is in place, um, uh, where there are sectors that are really truly are essential. I think no one could possibly be against that. No one is a masochist, no one is a sadist in all of this. It wants the economy to suffer longer than they have to. But that's simply, I don't think that's any bold forecast. That's simply what's going to have to happen. It's going to open up gradually over time as it's safe to do so. No sooner, but also no later than it's safe to do so. I'll just add, I agree with everything Tom said in his last two answers. Um, and just to echo what he's saying, you know, in the United States, you could possibly entertain, if we had done it earlier, especially with testing, vertical, uh, um, vertical uh, sheltering. But in a country like Brazil, especially with the distribution of income, it's very difficult to say, how are you going to separate old, the elderly from, from young people that live in one room? It's impossible to do it. So I, I think you're absolutely right, Tom. There's really no other way. You kind of keep things from overwhelming the, 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 the medical infrastructure. And the only way to do that is social distancing. Yes, yeah, Sydney, the only thing I would, um, would add here is that the, the economic impact, which is what is driving the idea of reopening, is going to be a function not only of the virus and um, and that raises the issues that, uh, that uh, Tom and, and John have raised. Um, but the economic impact is also going to be driven by, you know, consumer confidence, uh, willingness to spend, willingness to travel, willingness to eat in restaurants again. Um, and, um, and it also is going to be dependent upon sort of spillovers from, from other global economies. So whatever any one country does, you know, depending on what happens to activity in China, for example, and what's happening to oil prices, et cetera, it, it's not as simple as saying, you know, it, it's not really in the hands, I think, of policymakers today to sort of reactivate the economy by waving a wand and saying, we're going to um, eliminate containment in a particular region. Yeah. No. Thanks, everyone.
So great, actually, let me put you in a spotlight again. And as a guest commentator, I'd like to ask you a favor. Could you ask a question to our panelists and something that we haven't talked about before and that you think that they disagree with you? Well, I think, um, I think they disagree. Um, and I would be interested in getting uh, the perspective from, from John and Tom. You know, my concern with, my concern is, a Q, you know, can a country, can a country um, like Brazil actually put in place quantitative easing um, of the kind that's being discussed? Uh, the central bank, uh, you know, has, has operational or has had operational autonomy. It has a strong reputation uh, in markets, has a strong reputation among price setters in Brazil. Uh, has been very successful in uh, in tackling inflation, uh, but um, isn't isn't that um, sort of playing with fire or taking something that may work in uh, in in the G7 textbook, um, but but it's um, awfully dangerous in an emerging market uh, space. Yeah, and for our non-technical audience, our people with an economics background, if you could explain the 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 basic the basis for a quantitative easing approach. Well, I'll ask the two, <laughs> I'll, I'll, ask the, I'll ask my uh, t uh, Tom and John to uh, give me their, I learned years ago and, um, in uh, another country asking a central banker how to define something. Yeah. And uh, afterwards, every member of the board met, uh, they all gave me different answers. And then they had a board meeting to discuss why none of them could agree on what it was they were even talking about. So. <laughs> I'm going to leave that to, to Tom and John rather than opening up another can of worms. John, uh, personally, I think you hit the guy. I don't, you want to start? Uh, no, uh, no, I want our, our ex central banker to start. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, Brazil is a uh, one of the greatest quantitative easing countries in the world. They have, you know, decades, you know, go back to Ensinamento back in the, in the 19th century. They're really good at printing money, which is basically quantitative easing is if you get to a point you, where you can't use interest rates, you buy assets by creating reserve uh, monetary base. And Brazil has done that. Now, yes, it's dangerous. Is Brazil in a situation where it's dangerous right now? That's, I think that's an open question because we've seen Brazilian financial markets and all markets, uh, but mainly the Brazilian one, local ones, reacting in what I would call a normal way, you know, which they never did uh, when, the, when the central bank was easing. Typically, you would see, um, uh, uh, you know, inflation expectations surge, the central bank would you'd lose control of the exchange rate, and uh, inflation would accelerate rather quickly. Uh, what, what, what holds things in? And I think it really is the, uh, the prospect that you get back to fiscal reasonableness. Not, not necessarily greatness. And having the structural uh, reform um, among others, but the most important one is Social Security. Brazil's Social Security system was, uh, except maybe Greece, it has the most bankrupt system that I've ever seen. Uh, and you just don't, right now it's still running a, a primary deficit of four and a quarter percent of GDP if you add the RPPS, the RGPS. But the prospect of not having to have those deficits accelerate, and certainly the, the, the RGPS one was accelerating with the aging, uh, is, is one, it's a really important thing in terms of expectations at the fiscal side. Uh, at some point or another down the road, they will get it back in line. It's going to be a tough course. But I think partially the reason we're seeing decent reaction of expectations, expectations that the, right now the market is cut is, uh, is discounting a, a Selic rate almost under 1% at this point. Uh, you would never have seen that. You would have seen any worries that the fiscal side was expanding. You'd see it, you know, market interest rates spiking. You wouldn't see, even though it's a steep curve, you wouldn't see it so flat. So I, it is definitely a, a dangerous uh, uh, thing. I think the policymaker, certainly Monsuetta was, he didn't want to talk too much about monetary policy. They are very cognizant of that. And they want to make sure that the perception is this is aid for for a, a pandemic. These aren't supposed to be meant aren't meant for permanence. And these and then, then the fight is afterward to 
keep them from staying permanent once it goes. But I'm I'm a little more optimistic than than Tom on the real economy. Though I was I actually ventured uh, forecast uh, fiddling with forecasts today, and they surprisingly corresponded to to Montsuetos, especially on the fiscal side. We're going to get a, a primary deficit of about eight percent of GDP at the, by the end of the year. That's what it looks like, Maybe. especially with the six hundred and eighty billion reais that they're either approved or pushing through. But, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, the, the fact that, you know, I think the underlying trends in the economy, despite the slow recovery, were pretty strong. And I say that for the following reason. You can explain a good portion of the poor recovery from three major shocks and one temporary one. The first was the trucker strike in 2018, which caused a very big negative carryover. And Brazil is hobgoblin to, they are at ransom. These guys can take them because they never invested enough in railroad transportation. So they are, they are, they are um, hostage to the truck drivers. Second was the second tailing, ta uh, tailings pond disaster in Mumajinho, where they had to basically shut down all uh, iron ore and steel production, it, especially in Minas Gerais. They just shut down all the mines and that massively hit intermediate goods. If you look at the other parts of the components of GDP, they were pretty good. You know, consumption was growing 2%, services were growing 2 to 3%. So then the third one was Argentina, the collapse of Argentina. So you, you saw, even though you saw a very strong recovery in, in demand before all the COVID uh, uh, of double digits for almost two years straight in durables uh, demand, especially automobiles, exports to Argentina fell by 50%. And then we add the fact that people were waiting for the social security reform to pass and that kind of stopped investment for a while. So I don't, I don't think the economy, it was disappointing for sure, but I, I don't think it's uh, the underlying uh, sentiment was as bad as, as that. I think there is a recovery story here once this passes, but it's a tough one and it's not a short road. So I talked too long, sorry about that. I, I just like to say, I know Professor Newman is going to give me a good grade on this answer, but uh, quantitative easing in my mind is how the central bank, in this case, the central bank of Brazil, can lower borrowing costs for companies other than by reducing interest rates. Because interest rates, as John just said, are pretty much near rock bottom. It's 3.75%. John says the market is discounting 1%. But that's not such good news because the private sector can't borrow at any rates. The market, remember the, the chart on capital outflows. So what the central bank does, instead of lowering the interest rate from three to one, it'll do that and that may help, but it will massively go into the marketplace and purchase bonds from private sector companies who are otherwise good companies, but can't get, can't get anybody anywhere in the world to buy their bonds and to roll over their debt. If they can't buy their bonds and roll over their debt, those companies go bankrupt. So quantitative easing in this case is taking the liabilities of companies, private companies, and, and onto the balance sheet of the, of the Central Bank of Brazil. I, I don't know how great it's going to like that. That's, that's sort of the, the guts of, of quantitative easing. And I think you just got to do it. Now, he's, Gray, is, Gray is right that this is filled with, with uh, pitfalls. I mean, whose companies are getting their debt bought and whose aren't, and political favoritism and and aren't we getting, letting the, the private sector get away with murder when people are starving? And all that conversation will and, and, uh, occur and is uh, occurring. But I think the con basic concept is a good one. It hasn't been approved, all that preamble notwithstanding, it hasn't been approved yet and may not be approved, but I, I think it's likely to happen. It may not be decisive, Gray, but I think, uh, so I think you're right to be skeptical about it. The other aspect of quantitative easing is, the, the, is what John said, that the central bank has done this forever, which is to basically fund the government by buying the government's bonds. When, when, when this happens, the government, is, the central bank is basically printing money and financing government operations. But as John is also just suggesting, and Gray, I think, referred to this as well, this is a different Brazil from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s of high inflation, no credibility of, in monetary management or fiscal management. I mean, there's a lot of credibility in Brazil right now. Brazil can afford, I think, a period of time where most of the financing comes uh, from the central bank by buying bonds, very low interest rates. If the, if the basic interest rate is only 3%, that means people don't think there's a big risk right now. This could change, as Gray warns us. 
this could change, but right now they don't think there's a big risk that uh, Brazil is uh, not gonna pay you back. So take advantage of that, buy those bonds now, the government doesn't have a lot of debt servicing uh, responsibilities. And so I, that, that for me is, is, is quantitative, uh, quantitative easing. There's another related point which people have asked about, and that is about Brazil's international reserve. I don't know if John or, uh, mentioned or Gray, I think, there's like $350 billion in international reserves in Brazil. It's a slippery slope. You don't want to start selling those reserves, but you could. You could sell some of them, and with the proceeds, the central bank could transfer the proceeds back to the back to the federal government. But I don't think they're going to do that. I think that'd be the last thing they're going to do, because it could create panic uh, about the government's true financial. Great question, Ray. And uh, Tom, your answer was great. You 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 also tricked tripped another sort of memory wire. In the 2008 crisis, uh, the central bank, you had a lot of companies not able to roll over their debt externally, but the central bank wasn't allowed to directly lend to those companies. They can buy paper now, but they couldn't directly lend. So they set up a system where they auction credit lines in dollars off to, to use their reserves, off to the bank banking system. And most of this intermediation is done through the banks. It's not the central bank picking winners and losers. And that they can they auction those lines as well. They've been auctioning them uh, throughout and when, they, when they don't like what's going on in the foreign exchange market, where they're getting news that this particular company can't roll their external lines. They're there uh, quite quickly with an auction of lines. And that's also very, and it's as market-based as you can get. As, as, as Tom said, they really tried to, instead of it being heavy-handed intervention, they really tried to work through the market on this. And that's why it's been quite efficient. All right, so we have five minutes and let's switch gears here. And uh, at the end of every class, we always devote some time to talk about professional development. So let's finish on a positive note you know, in the midst of this crisis. And uh, when I say positive, it is because uh, the three of you have very distinguished careers, right? Uh, you have uh, developed all this expertise and have been recognized as a brilliant analyst uh, in Wall Street. Uh, you spent, or the three of you, uh, have this strong connection with academia. Uh, the, at least the two of you have all, also worked on the nonprofit sector. And uh, so I would like to ask each one of you to share one piece of uh, advice for our students who are starting to embark on their professional life. So why don't we start with uh, Gray Newman here? <laughs> You there, Gray? Mute myself. There you go. I have a hard time. Uh, you know, I, listen. Um, uh, you know, if, uh, I think I've probably said this before. You know, find find your own voice. Um, find what you believe in. Um, think about who you are. Spend a lot of time self-examining. Um, am I a numbers person? Am I the big pictures person? Am I the accountant? Am I the macro? Am I the um, service provider? Uh, figure out what you're good at, figure out what you enjoy doing and, um, and make sure that you use your career and use your opportunities wherever you're working to strengthen those, those areas. And uh, you know, try to balance yourself out. But at the end of the day, um, I think the, the best analysts are people that, um, uh, or the, I would say the best professionals are people that uh, spend time trying to really be introspective and understand who they are and, um, and, and do what you enjoy doing. Uh, in my case, um, I enjoy questioning. That's why I enjoy, the, I enjoy asking John and, uh, and Sydney and, uh, and Tom questions. But as an analyst, I, I doubt everything. So as an analyst, I would wake up every morning calling into question all of my thoughts and all of my, my uh, public views and sitting down with my team and arguing about where we could be wrong. But not everyone, that's not everyone's strength. So, you know, find, find your strength, find your voice. Um, and I think you'll be most successful if you do that. Thanks, great. Appreciate it. Yeah, so John. I don't know if I could say anything better than that, Gray. Uh, I would have to say, follow your passion. I'm I do what I do because it worked out that way. I, I, I love Brazil. Economics is my second favorite thing in the world behind football, soccer. Uh, and I was a much better, I'm a much better economist. You can see what kind of a player he used to be. And then as you do that, 
you tend to gravitate towards people that have the same passion. So I've been blessed to work with very generous people, and that includes both Gray and, and, and Tom. I met Gray when he was at, in Mexico at, at, at the embassy there years ago. I won't say how long, and I've known Tom even longer. I met him when he came to give a lecture at the University of Illinois. Uh, and I've just been blessed to work with just incredible people, especially uh, with Brazil. So, you know, the, my objective was Brazil, economics, and uh, Werner Bears found me and he said, you're not, you're not going anywhere else. You're going to do it here at Illinois. And, that, and, and there's just so many people that I've met over my career that are just really are my educators. And I, I don't think I'm as old as I am. I still am 17 in my head and still consider myself a, a student and always be a student and keep learning. And that's the only, I don't have anything else because I basically, when I choose, I don't choose well. When, when, when whatever it takes me to where I'm going, it works much better. Good, thanks, John. And last but not least, Tom. It's hard to follow up because yeah, I've been a mentor at least to John and he, his career turned out pretty well. So uh, I, I don't know if it's because John ignored my advice or followed it and uh, probably a mixture, a mixture of, uh, of both. Um, I, I agree. I mean, you, you, the three of us are going to, are giving you an answer that's a little skewed toward having a skill that having a confidence in your, in your ability to, to, to make a contribution. The three of us are all in economic, in the field of economics, but there are other fields as well. You do need to work on your, you do, I think it's not news to your students that you do have to come out of school with a sense that there's, this is a field that I know I'm passionate about and that I know something about and that I have a credential in. So I assume mostly your students are already doing that, but there's, that, that stays with you your whole life. And as John said too, and I agree with him, it's, it's perpetual learning. None of us knew about sudden stops caused by pandemics until weeks ago, but you know, you've got to always be open to learning, looking for opportunities to improve upon those skills and develop new ones. And that's kind of a platitude, I guess, in general. But what I'd like to finish with is, <clears throat> uh, I think all three of us, or let me speak only for myself, but I think you have sort of a, uh, a sense of public service, at least many students at Columbia do, those at SEPA primarily, but also throughout the university. Um, we're going through a crisis of leadership, and this is what this crisis, Sydney, uh, globally has shown us, and nationalism and populism, and God knows what else, racism, and uh, uh, rearing their ugly heads again. There is a tremendous crisis of leadership happening in the world, so I would encourage any of those students uh, to take inspiration in who I think are the heroes of today. They're not the investment bankers or the hedge fund owners of our time. They're right now, they're healthcare workers at Columbia University Medical Center. They're teaching uh, in New York City public school system or throughout or in back in their home countries. They're going particularly as John uh, and Gray's careers show better than mine. They go into and out of public service. They believe in public service. They believe they can make a contribution. So. Uh, I, I, I don't think I'm saying anything that would take people as particularly new, but I think get, get your, get, find your passion, get your skill, commit yourself to a lifetime of learning, and think about being in positions of leadership. If the opportunities are there for you, try it in the public sector. Try it in an area where you can give back to, to people. I think uh, forget about how much money uh, you're going to make or the prestige of the, uh, of the, uh, of the particular line of, of work that you choose. I think... I think that's what's important for this next generation, leadership, public sector, uh, giving back, education, healthcare, look for ways to contribute there because that's where the future of the world, climate change I could have mentioned too, but that's where the future of the world, uh, of your world um, uh, rests. Very well said, uh, Tom. And uh, we couldn't uh, have finished on such a higher note. No, thanks so much for reminding us why, why we're doing this and why we're here, right? It is to prepare people uh, and uh, share knowledge and inspire them, hopefully, to make a difference in the world. Talking about making a difference in the world, uh, we have one more session uh, in two weeks, and we're going to be talking about volatility and risk with the chief risk officer of uh, B3, uh, Andrea Montero. And I think it's going to be a good complement to today's session. Right? So uh, John, Gray, uh, Tom, and Julia and Berto talk and all the students and participants. Thanks so much for joining us. And I think we can say that this was a very successful uh, session, not only because of the quality, 
of the discussion, but also because we didn't get bombed by any attack <laughs> in Zoom. So uh, I feel relieved to be, uh, to say the least. Well, thanks so much. And again, congratulations. One. So uh, we'll be back in a, in a couple of weeks. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Sydney. Good night, everyone. Good night. Everybody stay healthy, stay yeah. safe. Thank you, Chan. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. to see you all. Thanks. Hi, Craig. Good night. Thank you.